Good afternoon, students, and welcome to today's mini lecture on the mind and methods of the natural scientist. I, of course, am your professor, Dr. Rob Steffen, and today we're going to take a deep dive into what it means to approach the ancient world through the disciplinary lens of the natural sciences. So get out your beakers, fire up those microscopes, and put on your goggles, and then journey with me as we investigate the natural sciences. Okay, so what exactly are the natural sciences? Well, you might think of this lens as science with a capital S, right? Uh, that's right, the type of science that lends its name to the scientific method. Now, the natural sciences use the scientific method to explore, interpret, and create a better understanding of the physical world and the complex spiderweb of interrelationships that exist within it. So when it comes to the ancient world, then, a natural scientist might be interested in better understanding natural phenomena and their influence on past societies. So in ancient Egypt, for example, a natural scientist might be interested in understanding the dynamics of the annual flooding of the Nile River, or measuring the impact of irrigation, or understanding the chemical reactions of the mummification process and their impact on body preservation. For the Greek world, natural scientists might look at the impact of climate change on population growth at the beginning of the Archaic period, or assess the chemical pigments of minerals used to decorate ancient sculpture or unlock the secrets of the Antikythera mechanism and its relationship to astronomical navigation. The Roman world is filled with questions and topics relevant to natural scientists as well. They could revolve around measuring how closely actual aqueducts match theoretical designs in terms of the efficiency of water distribution, or how, how remains of plant seeds preserved in the ash of Mount Vesuvius provide insight into the agricultural practices of the Roman Empire, or the structural impact of the development of the true arch or bricks or concrete on the development of Roman architecture. So the big thing here is that you're looking at natural phenomena from a scientific analytical perspective. But that's not all. Let's focus a little more on how natural scientists might approach some of these ancient questions. There are two main approaches that natural scientists use to understand the world. The first, as you might remember from your elementary school science class, is of course the scientific method. This of course is the fundamental way we understand the natural world. It begins with a series of observations about the world, and then from those observations we generate questions that can be answered. From there, we construct a hypothesis as to what we think the answer might be, and then design an experiment to test that hypothesis. Based on the results of the experiment, we draw conclusions about our question and the validity of our hypothesis. And then this all feeds back to where we started. We revise that question, we revise our hypothesis, we nuance it, we make it better, and we develop a new experiment to test our new idea. So let's take a look at an example of how this might apply in the ancient world. So let's say you're a natural scientist interested in ancient agriculture, and you notice that in all the ancient Egyptian sculptural reliefs and all the ancient Egyptian texts, you see that plants growing, uh, they grow after the flooding of the Nile. Now from this, you might generate a question like, why did ancient Egyptian agricultural productivity increase after each annual inundation? And your hypothesis might be something like that the abundance of water improved plant growth. Now to test this, you might devise an experiment using soil and plants from the Nile River Valley and add different amounts of water to each one with the goal of determining whether uh, how the amount of extra water impacted the growth of the plants themselves. Now let's imagine that the results show only a small marginal difference between plants you flooded with water and ones that were left only lightly watered. Well, then you'd have to conclude that the amount of water is the only thing facilitating agricultural productivity after the flooding of the Nile. So you'd have to go back then and readjust your hypothesis. Now, perhaps then it's a combination of the amount of water and the amount of newly deposited silty soil that facilitates that growth. Then you'd have to devise a new experiment that tested the impact of the newly deposited silt on plant growth. This cycle of observation hypothesis, experiment, and conclusion 
would then continue as we further refine our understanding of the Nile flood's impact on agriculture. Now, another way that natural scientists approach the world is by applying scientific principles, theories, and laws to understand the relationships between phenomena. In this example, let's imagine our natural scientist is interested in ancient architecture, and they notice that civilizations from throughout the ancient world have produced massive, grand, monumental buildings, from the pyramids of Egypt to the ziggurats of Mesopotamia to the temples of ancient Greece. But our natural science architect feels like Roman architecture is a bit different. All those other cultures build giant buildings that look awesome from the outside, but they only have a small, kind of relatively small interior space. Roman architecture, on the other hand, seems not only to have an impressive facade, but also vast, sprawling interior spaces. Monuments like the Pantheon and the Basilicas of Rome are larger on the inside than any of those in any of those preceding cultures. But why, right? What makes them different? Well, if you're a natural scientist applying the scientific principles, theories, and laws that you know and love, you leverage your understanding of physics to argue that the development of the true arch with the keystone and the vaults that derive from those arches allow for physically and mathematically uh, larger ceilings to cover greater distances than previous lintel roof systems. The weight of the roof is displaced to the ground with the true arch, whereas it rests over the open space with those lintels. Scientific principles in action. Now, you'll notice that with both of these methods, uh, they both include systematic data analysis and quantitative reasoning, which are frequently hallmarks of the natural scientific approach to understanding the world. And while the ancient history presented in textbooks and on television may focus on kind of narrative-based storytelling, the quantitative aspects of the past are just as important for understanding the world and the cultures of deep antiquity. So what does this all mean, right? What do we get out of taking a natural scientific approach to the ancient world? Well, for one, you gain a much better understanding of how we know what we know. The explicit process of the scientific method is a reproducible strategy for creating, amending, and improving our knowledge of the ancient world. Second, it gives us a much better sense of how humans interacted with the natural world throughout history, the benefits provided by the environment, the constraints imposed by the environment, and the strategies that humans have leveraged to overcome those, those constraints. And finally, by understanding the way that humans have interacted with the natural world in the past, we can gain a better sense for the consequences, both good and bad, of our actions here in the present. So don't think that being a natural scientist is just for Bill Nye the science guy. It's for all of us who want to better understand our world, past, present, and future.